it anyway. <laughs> So the good news is this, this this talk can go anywhere between eight minutes and two hours. So uh, that's the anxiety that I wanted to hear. All right, good, good, good. All right, so that was a good, that was great. It was Wayne, right? Right. Excellent, excellent. Al, great job worship this morning. You guys give a round of applause. It was awesome. Dana, Andrew, awesome, proud of you guys. Sounded good, sounded good. Um, so, it's my turn to talk. You guys ready for this? All right, so, we are all passionate people. It's kind of why we're here. Like, we, we get things in us, and they make us come alive. And it's, you know, it, for some of us, it's it's football. For some of us, it's, it's another sport. For some of us, it is, you know, making food and serving people. For some people, it's, it's counting, doing the accounting jobs. It's doing <coughs> cleaning. It's doing just, there's some people that have some passions that they, it gets them out of bed in the morning. They tell me they're excited about it, and I yawn. But we all are passionate about something. We all have something that, that is our reason for getting out of bed in the morning. With passionate people, there's this emotion that comes up in us that we don't know what to do with. We do not know what to do with it. Um, I spent the week, this has been a great week for me, I spent the week dealing with people at work. I run a restaurant. Right? And doing that, I'm a pastor. That, that's what I do. I work with people every day. There's a different something that happens every day. I have to coach somebody through it, get them through the other side, make them feel good about themselves again, and then say, go to work. And it's a daily thing. And this week I got to pastor myself and had an issue come up at work where I was supposed to have a meeting at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. Well, the person calls me and says, 7 a.m. instead of 11 a.m. Excellent, no problem. I love doing meetings way earlier in the morning than I do later in the morning because we're done, we move on, let's get other things done. Someone doesn't show up to the meeting. And it wasn't me. <laughs> Alright. So I'm 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 at meeting point at seven AM. Text message. Hey, I'm here, ready when you are. No response. Phone call. Straight to voicemail. I get a text message back. If you're having an emergency, call me back right now. If not, I'll deal with you later. Ooh. So then I thought, okay, I know that you can set your phone up now when you're asleep to send somebody a text message and just kind of cover your bases. And that bothered me. I was like, okay, are you asleep and you're sending me automated text messages? Or are you really saying that you forgot about what we got going on this morning, and I, so I get angry. I'm mad. Because anger is the is the emotion that takes place in us that nobody knows what to do with it. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody want to deal with it. Um, so I get I get pretty upset. And then, so eight o'clock hits, no no nothing. Nine o'clock hits, I still haven't been reached out to nothing. Eleven o'clock hits. And the person I'm supposed to meet with walks into our store and walks right back out of it. No word, no eye contact, nothing. I am furious <laughs> at this point because I felt very disrespected. Now, he and I have talked since then, so he knows that, that this has taken place. Uh, we actually sat down and talked last night and said, I'd love to use our moment this week to talk about in church. And he goes, hey, great, that sounds awesome. So what took place was I sent him a text message as soon as he walked out, and I said, are you coming back tonight? And he said, I'm not planning on it. And I said, well, you might want to plan on it because we have to talk about what took place this morning. And it was a couple days later that I saw him. We're good. We're good. Everybody's like, oh my God, is he dead? <laughs> so, it's fine. so what took place is, uh, a couple days later, I finally see him. So I kind of 
our office is in a corner, and so I kind of do this thing where I, I walk in, into the office, you know, just, he sees me coming, so I just kind of back him in, so I get him in there, shut the door, and I, I lock it. And I say, I need you to know something. <laughs> I have been angry with you. And he says, okay. I said, I don't know what happened Tuesday morning when we were supposed to meet. To which he responds with a story that I can't tell you, but it was a very good reason <laughs> for, for blowing me off. But I said, okay, so here's what we've got to do. When we make plans together, something like that comes up that is legitimately a reason to not do it. I just need a text message that says, hey, I can't do it. That's all I need. I want to feel like I'm actually important enough in this relationship that you're going to let me know a higher priority came up. Let's do this at a different time. He looks at me and says, I can do that. Great. Not angry anymore. So, what I want to talk to you guys about today is, after that took place, I'm at work, and one of the other managers says something to me along the lines of, Oh, it looks like you're not so angry anymore. Uh, but I'm not. But thank you for noticing. I guess I showed that. <laughs> angry. Didn't mean to. But um, but one of the guys that works with me is a worship pastor in another church. And he's standing in there and he goes, hmm, angry. I don't do that. I go, really? How do you sleep at night? Just don't do anger. And another guy, he kind of sticks his head around the corner and goes, I try not to get angry. Like, I do everything I can just to not do it. I'm going, where are the dead bodies? Like, what are you doing with these people? Because you have to get angry. See, God made us in such a way that we have a wide range of emotions. And... Anger is in us. It's in Him. He gets angry about things. But He deals with it healthy. We try to cut off things that we don't understand. Anger is one of those things because we don't know what to do when we're angry. Nobody tells us. They tell us, don't get angry. You could be upset about something. Don't get angry. It's okay to get angry. See, what happens when we get angry is something has taken place in our life and we feel like we're out of control. We've reached a moment where we say, I, I show up four hours early to a meeting and I'm the only one there and I, I can't control the other person to get them there at this meeting. Can't do it. So what anger does for us is it puts us in a place where we get to reevaluate our lives in that moment. All right. Now, my wife will tell you, my favorite thing to do when I'm angry is say, I'm mad at you, I need 20 minutes to calm down and we can talk. Which I do that a lot. That's not with her, but just in general. If somebody makes me angry, I will let them know, I am angry. We can't talk right now or I will hurt you. Maybe not physically, but you will not be able to survive the emotional wounds that I will give you in this moment. So give me 20 minutes and we will do this. So anyway, it gives us a chance to evaluate what in our relationship can I control? I can control when I'm on time. I can control if I'm prepared. These are the things that I can control in our relationship in this, in this story I'm telling you. What I can't control is whether or not you're on time. Whether or not you are engaged or focused. So now I have at my disposal what I can bring to the table, and then what I need from you to bring to the table. So, that's where we say, I can be on time. I did my part. What I needed from you was either be there on time or let me know you can't make it. Now we don't have anger anymore. What we have is a moment in our relationship where we hit a point where we have conflict. We suffer through the conflict, we communicate our needs, and now we have a reference point for the future that we cannot go back behind. 
Now we know that if we're running late, we have to reach out to each other. You can't say, oh, I forgot, or I didn't know you needed that. We now have a reference point. So we're actually building a foundation to be able to grow our relationship further than it was before we had our conflicts. So I'm telling you guys all this today because I'm going to be here for a while, and I'm probably going to make you angry. <laughs> all right. So I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know that if you bother me, I'm going to let you know you bothered me. And I'm probably going to ask for, I'll give you a set amount of time. Yeah. I'm getting pretty good at figuring out how angry I am. Like, depending on what took place, if I ever tell you I need a couple of days, you need to hide. Okay. But if I tell you, you know, let me call you 30 minutes and we'll, we'll talk about this, then we're good. We're, we're, you're going to be okay, but we're going to we're going to rehash in 30 minutes. And but the same thing goes for you. If we have a situation and I say I need 30 minutes to calm down and we talk, please say no. That's not enough time. I'm frustrated too. Let's do an hour. But what we're doing here is, see, a pastor over here, he values realness in people, which is one of the draws of me coming here. You know, he talks about us. Con uh, confessing our sins to one another so that we have a, a clean record at all times. We need some practical things that we can carry out of this to be able to do this. Because in order to live in community, we have to decide that the first priority is our connection with each other. We have to decide that that's our first priority. You see, that's what God did. That's the purpose of Jesus. He said that my number one priority is to be connected to that that I created. His anger brought about the reason of Jesus. Jesus covered the gap. Now we have direct connection. Make sense? A little out there? We good? Alright, so the, uh, the scripture passage I wanted to share with you today, which we're way out of loop now, so we're good. Uh, if you will, open your Bibles to page 687. <laughs> uh, for me, that is John chapter 2. And, and, yeah. Anywhere is good. <coughs> Anything is good, just go with it. Really, the scripture is for the fact that I've never heard anyone use it and give a talk, and I just wanted to use it and give a talk. My <coughs> are too small. Right? All right, so we're going to start in verse 13. The Jewish Passover was near. So Jesus went to Jerusalem, and in the temple he found people selling ox, sheep, doves, and he found money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple complex with their sheep and oxen. He poured the money all over the floor and told the people who were selling doves, get out of here, stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. <coughs> um, I'm reading the TJ translation of the... NIV, I think. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews replied to him, what sign of authority will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this sanctuary and I will raise it up in three days. To which they said, it took us 46 years to build this and you can do it in three days. And that's my, that, that's my example of what we talked about with um, getting angry and then setting boundaries. He was mad with these people. He told them that they could not do what they were wanting to do. And they said, well, if you have authority, you should show us your authority. And he said, tear it down and I will show you a better temple. <coughs> and he did. So he did. So. Am I the only one that gets angry? Okay, good, good, good. Some of you guys are looking at me like, right, we're going with this. I think I've already went where I want to go. Now I'm just filling time for that two-hour, you know, part. <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. 
but part of part of the success that we will see in life with each other at Troy Community Church, you know, for some of you students that are going to be graduating and moving on, for the rest of us that are going to be staying here forever, using our emotions to establish boundaries is the most life-altering tool you can achieve. Practice it now while you have a safe place. You know, if you're Chi Alpha, I know Justin will work with you on this. Boundary setting is like if I remember Greek, I don't know if you're still on it, but you were on it. But you know, <coughs> the, the thing about boundaries is the same thing that floats a boat is the same thing that will sink a boat. Boundaries are what determines the success of the boat. Okay. So that being said, I'd like you to stand. not doing a pledge. I'm going to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would take these words and put them into our hearts today. And that you would give us the strength to put into action the things that we've learned. Give us the wisdom to see how to apply it. And give us the opportunity to practice as much as possible. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <coughs> What time is it? Eleven thirty. Well, that was good. Would anyone like to share? We usually open it up for comment, sharing. What has God said to you? Would anyone like to share? What you heard? For the for the visitors, this is what we do every week. Um, I didn't actually. Told TJ that he had to do this, so he handed it to me, so I'm doing it. Uh, it's one of my favorite times every week, is to hear what people share that they heard. Would anyone like to share? We don't have to, but if you have something to share, we want to hear it. I know whenever we were um, dating, we talked a lot about communication. And... Whenever we started doing, getting ready for premarital counseling and did our, our a premarital Bible study together, we just really started delving into how <coughs> vital communication is, and and especially in a marriage, there are times whenever I will do something that will irritate him, or he will do something that irritates me, and I have a habit of I don't say anything and I just put it in a cabinet. And then the next day, he'll do it again, and I put that in the cabinet. And then the next day, it happens again, and then eventually <coughs> my cabinet is full, and it cannot. And being able to say, okay, open the cabinet. Okay, here's all the stuff that I've been storing up. Help me, let's, let's get this over with, and let's, let's start again, and let's not, <coughs> let's, let's put a lock on that cabinet so I can't put my anger in there. Let's. Let's, oh, let's communicate, let's talk about, let's, let's just do, bleh, yeah, I don't know how to say it, but whenever you do that, um, and you, that's not what you're supposed to do, but whenever that happens, and you, you reset your communication standard, and you reset, you know, here's how I'm feeling, how are you feeling, okay, where, can, how can we move forward from this, how can we get over this, and how can we, rebuild our communication that broke down. And as long as we communicate with one another, that doesn't happen. It, it can't happen. As long as you're communicating, anger is really hard <coughs> to get to. It. it all happens whenever you stop communicating, you stop talking. In my arms. Leo, and then, and then Audrey. Emotions are a very complex thing. Um, in our speak, society, a little, speak a little bit louder. In our society and in our culture, um, emotions like anger or sadness have negative connotations with them, happiness having a positive. Um, you shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't be sad. You should be happy all the time. Um, you know, TJ mentioned someone that's like, I don't do anger. Well, 
people that oftentimes speak like that forget that God is also felt anger. Forget that God is also grieved. That God has had rage. You know, people that look down on other people for also doing so are kind of looking down on God, um, putting themselves in a position where they feel they know better. Um, we're given emotion for a reason to respond to to stimulus. Um, in fact, if you're not able to properly respond, there might be something wrong. Um, I'm a psychology major, so that's actually kind of interesting. But um, an improper response to stimulus, if something that is supposed to make you angry does not make you angry, there, there might be something wrong. Um, and that's true. Um, and the real, the real truth is all emotions are good and bad. Um, if you have a rival and you see them get fired or demoted, you may have a response of being happy. Is that, an okay, is that an okay response? No, it's not. It's not really a godly response. It's, it's an emotional reaction. Um, and just because it's happiness doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it positive. Um, if you see things like poverty rates and it gets you upset, that's an okay thing. That's something to be upset about. Um, we were given emotions for a reason. We have to learn how to use them. We have to learn when it's okay to use them, but they're important. And, you know, this in direct result, God made us in His image. And He also feels emotions. Now He feels them perfectly. He knows the right time and place. And He acts with them in the right time and place. Us not wanting to use our emotions, or us not wanting to understand our own emotions, is doing God a very huge disservice. Hmm. Uh, I was going to say, um, speak a little louder if you would. <laughs> I'm a lot like TJ with the, you know, I need like, I need a while when I get mad, especially with Josh. <laughs> <laughs> That's her husband. That's her husband. Uh, Josh. Uh, now, is he going to be okay with you saying this while he's, yeah. okay, he's a, <laughs> in children's <laughs> church? Yeah, he's a, he's a children. Anyway, okay. he, um, he hates, he likes confrontation. He likes to communicate. And I, I don't. I like the silent treatment. It's, and he hates the silent treatment. So, but I have this. I have this really annoying quality about myself that um, when I'm angry with somebody, and I've had it my whole life, and it's one of my worst qualities. When I'm angry with someone, I notice little details, like little flaws and quirks about people that, like, I like take out of them and I shove it back in their face. And I, when I'm angry. I tend to do that. Like I don't yell at them. I don't cuss. I don't do any of that. But that's what I do, and I, I intentionally hurt people. And it's one of the worst qualities that I have. And so I'm silent. Like I don't say anything when I'm mad at Josh. I need I need a while <coughs> to not to not say anything. And I think when like especially when I'm angry, and it took me a long time to like do that, like to be silent, because I used to just like blurt it out. But um, I think God taught me that you can be angry, but it's how you respond, like Leo was saying. It's how you respond. And if you can be angry, but don't do it in a sinful way. That w what I was doing, intentionally hurting people just to, you know, because I was angry, that's sinful, and that's not okay. <coughs> and God, God has been angry in the past, and he does get angry at people, and he does grieve, but he doesn't do it in a sinful way. I just, and I'm glad that you taught me that, and that's why I'm silent when I get that. <laughs> um, TJ made a comment in his teaching about me. He said, your pastor likes people to be genuine. I think something to that effect. And what we just, now look, every comment that's been made has been really good. Okay, so I don't want anyone to think I'm gauging these on some scale. But what Audra just did is opened her cabinet up for us to see it. And I just think that was awesome. I mean, 
I've, I've grown to love and respect Audra over the several year, several months they've been here. <laughs> several years. The several months that they've been here, and uh, I just that was really awesome that you shared that, Audra. And I want you to know that that was really that was really awesome. We all have our we all we all have these issues, and we all want to be loved. Uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm a big fan of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor when Hitler took over Germany. He was a pastor in Germany, and he had a significant resistance to the Nazi party and to the church for letting themselves be taken over by the Nazis. And in his book, Life Together, which I think I shared about one of the first weeks in our church, is one of my, it is my favorite writing of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But he makes a statement, and I often repeat it, we are a fellowship of saints. Something to this, I might not get it exactly right, but it's we are a fellowship of saints and a community of sinners together. So when Audra says what she just said, that's like saying, I, and, and Bonhoeffer speaks of this, the community of saints and the, and the fellowship of sinners, whichever one you put with it, doesn't matter, they're interchangeable says, open your cabinet and show me your sin and I'm going to love you more for that. I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not going to use it against you. I'm going to love you more for that because guess what? I've got a cabinet that I need to open up and I need you to love me back. And I tell you, there's such power in that. So, uh, I was just very blessed. Listen, man, this has been a great... I'm really happy. I think we've had a great moment, a great day in the house of the, uh, you know, in the in the fellowship of the saints. I almost said house of the Lord. You know, last week I talked about how the building, the building is not the church. You know, we get into that, and I'm sorry, I was a faux pas because this church, this building is not the church. This, I mean, what she just did, that's the church, right? So. Um, for you visitors, I apologize if this has been a... But this is how we operate. We're real. This is something that I, that I really do prize, is hearing from each other. I think Sydney, two or three weeks ago, made a great statement about being... That, she, that her voice... Uh, that we want to hear her voice. You remember? Was, that was a great That was a great comment. And, that's, and Wayne, thank you for sharing. None of this, you know... Uh, I didn't know exactly what was coming, although Wayne and I had talked some a little bit, but um, I appreciate you sharing, Wayne. I think it all dovetails rather nicely in what we're doing. <clears throat> and now, you know, my 58-year-old brain, I can't remember what I was about to say <laughs> about what you said. I apologize. Oh, God, help me. Uh, getting older is not as, you know, no. yes, it, 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 your brain doesn't seem to work. Well, let me pray. And we're going to close out, but uh, thank you very much, you guys. To those, Andrew and Audra and Dana and Hunter helping me with worship, um, you know, I, I was real uptight. <laughs> I was really uptight, uh, and I almost just said, let's just not have worship. And, uh, and you know what, I have to tell you, TJ came up and said it sounded, when we were up on the stage practicing, when some of you were coming in, I mean, I was just like, oh, God, help me. I can't do this. This is, it sounds horrible. I can't, and it wasn't any one thing. And then TJ said, oh, it sounded really good. And I, and I didn't believe it. And I said, are you kidding around? And, and then he made me aware of what I do know about him is that he doesn't, he tells you what he really thinks. <laughs> whether, whether you want to hear it or not, he's going to tell you. And, but when he did that, I felt suddenly better. I felt like, Okay, if TJ's telling me that and he means it, then it must be these monitors or something. Because <laughs> it was horrible. But what that allowed me, now you know, this sounds like I'm way off track, but this is tying everything together. Our community. You know, I was feeling really bad about leading worship. I met with our leadership team on Wednesday and said, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm stressing out over it. And they all told me, no, Al, you need to do this. We do want you to do this, you know, be to lead worship consistently so that TJ doesn't feel the burden every single week to do it. And uh, just the community, 
that operated. You know, I was stressed. TJ made that comment that he didn't have to make, but helped me tremendously so that I wasn't feeling so self-conscious. And, um, and then all the guys who helped, you know, Hunter and the, and the sound, everybody, thank you. And it was wonderful. Wayne's sharing was great. And then TJ, your, your word was great. And then those of you who have shared, I think it, all, it has all been great. So with that, I will indeed close in prayer. And then we can all do what we need to do. Lord, thank you. What a wonder it is to be in your, in your family. We have heard through TJ about, really, and Wayne, about being in your family and what it means. Help us to be the family of God. As I've shared, Lord, we, we've just all experienced bad stuff in church. Help us to be an anecdote, an anecdote against that. An antidote against that that we would love, that we would accept, that we would help each other through sinfulness like Audra shared about. Because we all have it. And we need you, Lord. And the fact is, we thank you because you have put us together. You have given us hope. You have forgiven us. And we don't have to carry that heavy weight of the bad stuff that we've done or even that we still do. We can lay it down because you have taken it from us. Thank you. Bless all these who've come and uh, help us to have a good week of being your people to the rest of this world. And I just remembered you guys, so I'm going to lead us in prayer for this. Lord, please help us this Tuesday in our election. It is a, we are in a crossroads in our nation. I pray in Jesus' name that we will not have violence on Tuesday or the days following no matter who wins this election, Lord, help your people to stand up and say the right things to keep us as a people from destroying each other. We ask you to do that, Lord. We're asking you to protect this country from violence and, and just ridiculous things happening in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, uh, sorry about tying all that together, but...